so what is has led inexorably to this slide well i will go back to my pragmatic point which they did anticipate which is that the losers would um prey on the winners hello and welcome to a theory of everything i'm luis razo the director of asem and host of this channel today i'm talking for a second time to professor amy wax the Robert Moonheim Professor of Law at the University of Pennsylvania. She has one of the most impressive academic and professional backgrounds of anybody you'll ever meet. She received a bachelor's degree in molecular biophysics, summa cum laude from Yale University, after which she studied philosophy, physiology, and psychology as a Marshall Scholar at Oxford. She then got an MD with cum laude distinction from the Harvard Medical School, after which she went to Harvard Law School before getting her JD from Columbia University. In the interest of brevity, I will not list her many professional achievements and awards. I encourage you to watch my first discussion with her to review where I think she and her work fits into the grand scheme of things in the US today. Today's discussion starts with one of her most recent articles a link to which you'll find in the video description. And we try to get to the causes of what we both agree are a troubling series of developments in democracy and the Western world as a whole, although I think what troubles us differs somewhat. You'll see that we also differ about causes, and presumably we differ about what needs to be done to correct the situation. Hopefully we can talk about that uh, next time. For now, I'll leave you with the discussion. As always, you'll find a timestamp in the video description. Thanks for listening. Professor Wax, you are in Pennsylvania, and I am in Barcelona once again. Thanks so much for doing this again. Welcome to A Theory of Everything. My pleasure to be here. Great. So the last time we talked, we talked about a number of very interesting things. We got some good feedback. You have people that are very interested in your, in your work and your uh, thoughts. Can you tell us what you are working on now? What, uh, what are you teaching? What are you writing, et cetera? Well, I, um, I just published an article, I mean, really a week, a week and a half ago in the University of Chicago Law Review online. And, you know, in the United States, we have very old fashioned law reviews that are published with a very long timeline of production, but the law review editors who are all students have kind of wised up and decided to start these online divisions of their law reviews, uh, which have of course a much shorter turnaround time. So the Chicago Law Review people decide to do a symposium on the future of affirmative action in the United States. And they invited me to contribute, which in the United States is sort of a brave act if you're a law student. Um, but I decided to write about something that's been on my mind for a while, which is the shift from a remedial rationale for affirmative action to a diversity rationale in the educational sphere or in, in, in terms of educational affirmative action or uh, race preferences that are used for admissions and selection. And that's been a, a centerpiece of affirmative action jurisprudence and attention for a very long time. But as a result of that, the issue of I'm, I'm affirmative sorry. action- Can you explain yes. quickly when this shift took place? It took place uh, in through a series of opinions. It all really started in a case called Bakke, which was a case uh, in the 1970s in which Justice Powell, it, to broker a, um, a decision in that case, um, decided that it was okay to use affirmative action in a uh, university setting, which was the issue there. It was actually a medical school, California Medical School, because it served a pedagogical purpose to have people go to school with a variety of individuals from a variety of backgrounds. Um, and he kind of broke uh, a, um, a stalemate, let's say, on the court as to whether affirmative action, that is race 
conscious selection or some degree of race conscious selection was consistent with the United States Constitution. And he said, well, at least in the educational context, it is because there's a compelling interest in having a diversity of backgrounds in the university setting because that enhances education and we're going to defer to educational experts. This, this is really important. And it had a way of kind of limiting the purview of affirmative action and when it was permitted. Uh, the problem is that uh, educational affirmative action became such a focus and there was a series of decisions after that that reaffirmed, affirmed and reaffirmed the importance of diversity that attention was drawn away from the employment context. Now, the employment context jurisprudence is rather complicated, but all you really need to know is that recently in the wake of all the George Floyd turmoil and all of this systemic racism focus uh, that's become very politically salient, a lot of companies have issued these pledges to engage in much more aggressive affirmative action in hiring and in promotion. It's right? been very, Even that's right. It's been very public, right? This, this, very uh, public. this push so for Microsoft, any company you can think of has either voluntarily or felt constrained mm -hmm. to pledge and promise to hire a lot more underrepresented minorities. And in the United States, that means essentially blacks to a lesser degree Hispanics because other groups from Asian backgrounds, European backgrounds, they tend to be fairly competitive for these positions. It's blacks that are lagging behind in their qualifications and competitiveness. Ex and excuse so that me. brings- Excuse yeah. me, in, in, at some point you'll explain where the Asian um, group fits into this picture, I suppose, right? Well, they're mostly ignored and that's part of the interesting thing. They're ignored because uh, even though they are um, part of the oppressed minority grievance group, when you actually look at their position in American life, you see that they're incredibly successful and they're perfectly able to compete. So they're, they're kind of an awkward embarrassment for the whole victimology narrative. But I'll just put that aside for a moment and describe my article. So my article really says, look, there's something interesting here that is little noticed a little noticed fact, the Supreme Court has never ever said that diversity, increasing diversity in the workplace is a valid rationale, let alone a compelling interest for abandoning the color blindness of the US Constitution or the civil rights laws that apply to empo employment. Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, which says that selection shall be made without regard to race. And you know, selecting, promoting, distributing the incidents of employment on the basis of race is unlawful. So there's a contradiction uh, there. Yeah, well, there's a contradiction with the plain terms of the statute, but that was supposedly reconciled with a limited degree of remedial affirmative action in a case called Weber. But the Supreme Court has never gone on from there and said, well, like in the education setting, diversity is important. So diversity is another reason why you can choose people because of their race. And my article argues that there is absolutely no reason for the court to permit that. It can't extend the educational rationale, which is pedagogical value to the workplace. The workplace is not a site of learning and education it serves a radically different purpose. And there is little or no evidence that diversity across the board enhances the performance of every single workplace as a general matter. I mean, if that's true, it's true on the retail level in specific workplaces and it has to be shown. So there are claims made like, if you have more black doctors, it improves the health of minority patients, but those claims only apply to specific workplace settings. And the court should insist that there's actual evidence and proof of those things. It's easy to say these things, and it's very, very hard to show them. So the bottom line of my article is these pledges on the part of companies to increase diversity by engaging in race conscious practices 
will not stand up in court and should not stand up in court if they are challenged. And I'm hope I'm hoping they will be challenged. That's a whole nother topic because I think people are reluctant to challenge them because there's so much disapprobation attached to that, so much disapproval attached to challenging, you know, the whole diversity, inclusion, and equity uh, thrust. Are but there no are there no current challenges at the at the moment at the time? Well, not that I know of. I do know some lawyers who are working for firms interested in challenging diversity and inclusion training, mandatory diversity and inclusion training, because some of the assertions and statements that are made in those training sessions are very hostile to whites you know, uh, are insulting to white people, could make uh, people in the workplace feel harassed and unwelcome. It's sort of the flip side of what minorities uh, claim um, and are hoping to challenge it under hara the harassment arm of Title VII law, the anti-harassment arm. But those are the only work, uh, those are the only actual lawsuits that I personally know about. But I think that um, if you know Coca-Cola and Microsoft and Amazon and Apple really do make good on their pledges, uh, which are very hard and fast, very quota-like, um, that people who don't get hired, who are outside of the victim groups, would have a very sound basis for a lawsuit. And I'm hoping that, that we will see those lawsuits. I mean, one of the problems is that a lot of these practices are covert. They're very hard to uh, observe, to prove. There's a lot of denial. The companies will use a lot of mumbo jumbo about how they um, just take race into consideration or they're trying to level the playing field. They don't really have a litmus test. They don't really have a quota. Uh, so there are evidentiary obstacles and hurdles to bringing these lawsuits and winning these lawsuits. Uh, but the whole practice of racial spoils that we are now embracing in this country, I think is a very dangerous and pernicious one. Um, so I'm hoping the law will put a stop to it. Now, of course, with the election of Biden, uh, there's going to be a lot less official pushback against these sorts of practices both in the education sphere, I mean, the pushback is going to disappear essentially, uh, and in the corporate employment area, I fear. Uh, so that, that bodes ill for doing something about uh, these, these trends, I'm afraid. So this article of yours came out, you published it last week, is that correct? It was uh, about a week or two ago, yes. Okay, and what's the name of the article? Um, it's called Pursuing Diversity from Education to Employment. Okay, very interesting. And it's on SSRN. It's, it's uh, gotten a lot of attention. I keep getting these emails that it's the most downloaded article in this category and that category. So, Well, that's, that's good. good. That brings me to my next question. I was going to ask, how do you measure success in this line of work in, in terms of the, your writing of this article? How would you measure a great success of the article? Well, I mean, the, I think the pinnacle of success would be for an influential court to cite it as authority or persuasive uh, foundation for their opinion. That's sort of the ultimate fantasy. So I guess my ultimate fantasy is that uh, these issues will come before the federal courts, eventually before the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court will adopt my point of view, which is that um, color conscious uh, employment practices are illegal. Uh, there's no basis for them. There's no justification for them, except just the fashion of the day, the, the belief system and you know the preferences of the ruling elite who think it's a good idea. Um, that's, that should not be good enough. I mean, that's precisely what the civil rights laws were meant to prevent is, you know, one faction in society deciding that, you know, racial discrimination effectively is virtuous and therefore we're going to engage in it. 
those laws, as I read them, are meant to enshrine uh, color blindness, neutral, impartial selection into um, the business area, the sphere of the workplace. Uh, and I would hope that the courts would recognize that. Now, I also recognize that, you know, that's a tall order because our society, that's going to mean unequal outcomes for different groups just because of the reality of things. Uh, and I think less and less is that being accepted in our society. Well, that's a, that's a very profound, profound topic. And I'm not sure how to transition here. I want to ask you a little bit, one more question about the, your contact with these students. There's quite a bit of talk in various circles about the changes that have taken places, taken place on American uh, universities over the last couple of decades. Right. You're, you're actually on the ground and in the, room, in the classroom with these students. Do you perceive or how do your students receive your work, your lectures, et cetera? Well, I think there's been a dramatic change. Um, in a way, I'm kind of like the blind man with the elephant because one of the courses I teach is a course in conservative political and legal thought. It's an elective course. So the students who are gonna be taking that course are not gonna be representative of the student body as a whole. I would say the trend, one of the trends I've seen is that students avoid my courses. They avoid any contact with me because I, my views and my outlook and I am considered, you know, contaminating. So that is emblematic of this hypermoralization, um, this us versus them mentality that has taken place both in politics and that politics sort of coming onto campus, but actually it's the opposite. It's that we're all living on campus now, as Andrew Sullivan says, all of this, you know, hypermoralization, the Manichaean view uh, that progressives are good people and everybody else is evil started on campus um, with this uh, grievance culture uh, that now has a stranglehold over over all the discourse practically and at the university. Uh, and that's been generalized to the society as a whole. So the effects of that have been in a really a kind of self-censorship. I think that's the most dramatic effect that students um, who aren't with the program of these progressive ideas and beliefs uh, feel very intimidated um, they're afraid of being bullied, of being ostracized, of being penalized, of all sorts of social and official and quasi-official consequences. And so they silence themselves. There's, there's just a tremendous amount of that. Now that's made you know, classroom discussion a lot duller, I'm told. I don't really know because in my class, I take steps to guarantee that people can speak freely. Um, I ask my students to promise not to squeal on their fellow students to outsiders, um, not to take the course if they are inclined to complain to officials about opinions that are being expressed and the like. And as a result, I do not get, you know, a typical group. I get a, a sort of small renegade group of students who are not uh, on the same page as the predominant sets of opinions. Um, the other thing that's going on on campus, I think that's very concerning. Well, there are a number of things. One is that the faculty, and especially at elite universities, skews very, very far left. It's not representative of the population as the whole, even of the educated population, which is moving steadily left. Partly it's moving steadily left because the students are all taught by people who have very particular opinions, are not even handed about political issues, don't even present both sides of the story, exclude and omit uh, to teach about some of the really important conservative thinkers and ideas. Uh, and I'm certainly seeing that. I am seeing that in my students, they don't just reject conservative ideas, they are not even aware of them. They have never even heard some of the points of view uh, that are expressed on the right. They haven't read the big books. They haven't heard of the big authors. 
Uh, there's just a blank there for them. Uh, so I'll give you an example. Um, I was talking to some very elite graduates, uh, very of Ivy universities, people who have studied government, political science. Uh, and I asked them if they'd ever heard of Daniel Patrick Moynihan. Now, Daniel Patrick Moynihan was a, a senator, an ambassador, a government advisor who was very, very important and influential in the middle of the 20th century. And he worked for a number of different presidents. He also wrote something called the Moynihan Report, which was a report on the state of Black America and the Black family. This was in the mid 60s, and it got a lot of publicity because he said some critical things about the Black family, which some people didn't like. Anyway, I don't see how it's possible to study American politics and not have heard of Daniel Patrick Moynihan. Well, these students never heard of Daniel Patrick Moynihan. And why? Because the courses that they took decided uh, the syllabi simply omitted any mention of some of the concerns and critiques of the breakdown of the black family. That's just a verboten topic. It's, it's not something that you're allowed to discuss. Uh, I, that's my theory for why they've never heard of Daniel Patrick Moynihan. And I can just multiply that example you know, by dozens, dozens of people, points of view, that just get elided and airbrushed out. So that's one of the things that's going on at the university. Another trend in the university that's very concerning uh, and very expensive is the proliferation of diversity, inclusion, and equity, administrative bureaucratic positions and offices, uh, the astronomical growth of this part of the university, which, you know, for one thing, has driven up the cost of an education. I just saw a document the other day about the University of Michigan's diversity, inclusion, and equity infrastructure. We're talking here about 15 or 20 people, you know, associate deans, assistant deans, uh, deans, assistants of the provost. Jeez. The top people are making over $200,000 a year. The mid-level bureaucrats are making a hundred plus thousand dollars a year. Well, there are scarcely any professors at Michigan that make that kind of money. So we have this kind of super elite operating in the university, exercising thought control and engaging in incredible mischief of imposing an orthodoxy on the university. So between those two trends, it's, it's really a dire situation for free thought, I think. Well, you know what's especially tragic is that these uh, this administrative monstrosity <laughs> ends up costing uh, lots of student debt, lots of people who would probably do better in other places other than you know major universities, or or they're getting something that's costing a lot more than it's really worth, and that's right. that's really really tragic, I think. Well, you know, it's interesting of the, the person who produced this, this data set about Michigan's monstrosity, diversity monstrosity, calculated that if they fired all of those people, and frankly, I think they would be better off if they did. I think these people are worse than useless. They're, they're uh, a negative. That 700, they could fund 700 students tuition at the University of Michigan for the money that they're spending. So it absolutely is driving up the cost of education for the students who are there. You said, well, you know, maybe fewer people should go to university. Well, I agree with that. But I think one of the things that's going on with this bureaucracy is it's a place to park their graduates and especially their minority graduates um, and create this kind of faux upper middle class of prestigious positions which quite frankly are incredibly undemanding. I mean, it's just not that hard to preach the diversity, inclusion and equity gospel. It's a lot easier than being an actual scientist, being an actual professor, doing real research, working for a corporation and meeting the demands of your bosses. I mean, it's just this soft, cushy birth 
that's it's welfare for the middle and upper middle class is what it is but it's on the back of taxpayers dollars and it's also on the back of tuition paying parents and students and adds to the problem of this educational debt which is now on the front burner uh politically unfortunately sure well let's talk about causes what do you think ultimately are the causes of this situation and then the next question will be where do you think this is going to end so first causes what do you think is causing this well i have i i'll just say up front that i really don't know the answer to that question i have engaged in a number of discussions recently where people have asked me point blank you know where does all this wokeness come from why why all of a sudden you know do we have this extreme uh one-sided situation in academia of um ferocious imposition of orthodoxy of almost zero tolerance of dissent at the while everybody at the same time says you know how open-minded and and uh, rational they are which of course is all just window dressing um why why has that happened and you know here's the thing i mean i'm reminded of what hemingway said it happened very slowly and then it happened suddenly i mean these trends have been brewing for decades um i think they go back to i hate to bring out the usual whipping boy the 60s uh and you know the radical anti-establishment quasi-marxist leftist anti-capitalist turn that a lot of intellectuals took uh in the 60s um the expansion of the universities which allowed these people to go into positions of power the structure of the university which are self-perpetuating and self-policing and self governing under the guise of academic freedom. And this allowed the capture of a very important institution uh, by forces on the left. And of course, they went out and they seeded the press, journalism, uh, the think tanks. So they doubled down and consolidated their position of power. All the opinion shaping uh, institutions are now um, in control. Uh, of these factions. The other factor I think is the festering um, problem or problematic of race. Uh, you know, the civil rights movement worked real improvements in a lot of blacks and other quote unquote underrepresented minorities. There's no doubt about that, but uh, the palpable progress in outcomes and results uh, just hasn't been what people wanted and expected. Um, Blacks still are, you know, an underdeveloped group. They're still lagging behind. They still have high rates of crime. They have uh, poor educational outcomes relative to other groups. Their families are very weak and, and fractured. There's lots of trouble still in Black communities. And as a result, they're lagging economically and occupationally and educationally. And I think the growing frustration with that, um, coupled with this egalitarian ideology, has resulted in a real break with the kind of meritocratic equal opportunity assumptions of the past and this impatience that says, by hook or by crook, by any means necessary, we have to bring about equal results. And the ideological window dressing of that is all this anti-racism, talk about systemic racism and structural racism and, and all of this rhetoric, right? Which blames externals and white society for the lack of actual equality. Um, I reject that paradigm entirely. And I know there are a lot of people in society who do, but they've been silenced. They've been silenced by the accusation of racism. So when you put together the problems of race with the capture of key opinion shaping institutions by the left, then what you get is wokeism. And, and that's really what we have right now. 
uh, and I don't see it going away anytime soon. Um, I can't predict the future. I can only tell you this, there is a, um, an underground, uh, there is a um, resistance, so to speak, uh, it's out there. It marches under the name of Trumpism or classical liberalism or various rubrics. Uh, it's in eclipse, it's intimidated, uh, but it's not extinguished. I, I can tell you that because a lot of my friends, a lot of the people I know, uh, a lot of you know the salon society that I belong to is adamantly opposed to these developments and these ideas. Well, very interesting. You raised some interesting points. If you remember the last time we talked a little bit about um, Richard Herrnstein and his argument in the bell curve, Edwin many, many decades before the bell curve. And a lot of what you've argued now is uh, eerily similar to what, not exactly what he predicted, but in a sense what he predicted, because he said that if you have a society where you are recruiting for the most talented people, then you inevitably end up creating more polarization. And I think that's exactly what has taken place since the 60s, precisely when the US uh, started to become uh, a victim of its own success, uh, its own transparency, its own opening up of opportunities, et cetera. Right. That, that competition enabled, even within Blacks, more polarization within uh, Asians, within the Latino community, more polarization. I think the the response that we're seeing today is a response to that reality that people feel on the ground that something isn't right. Something, well, something... I think something isn't right because I think the expectations coming out of the meritocracy were unrealistic. I mean, you know, this is uh, something, this problem of increasing polarization, of stratification uh, from the meritocracy, which, you know, looks very fair and just. Um, and represents an improvement on many principles, was anticipated by Michael Young uh, decades ago. It, there are tons of books, books coming out regularly now about um, dumping on the meritocracy and, and laying bare all of these solecisms and problems uh, and paradoxes of the meritocracy. We are living with them now. And you, uh, Hernstein's just one of, of a number of people who have who predicted the current situation, which is ironically, you know, with more equal opportunity, more, more stratification, more polarization, more inequality, because, um, you know, if people are allowed to compete under their own steam of their abilities and talents and their determination and their industry and fortitude, um, they are going to, uh, generate unequal results. People are not equal in fact. The founders knew that. I mean, I just was reading the Federalist Papers and they understood that perfectly well. But, you know, we represent the sort of late uh, development of all of that, the twilight of the meritocracy, so to speak. Uh, and we really don't know what to do about it. Um, it's, it's not an entirely soluble problem. I mean, I, so, you know, we have a situation where if people don't do well, the temptation is to blame their own inadequacy for that, or people will blame their own inadequacy. And that part, wokeness is partly a rebellion against that saying, no, 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 there are forces larger than any of us that they're responsible for our failure, for our poverty, for our misfortune. It's the structures of society that are corrupt and that are rotten. Um, to some extent, they're right, but the problem is they're going to pull down the whole edifice. And you know, the edifice is responsible for our prosperity, for our excellence, for, a, uh, for our freedom, for a lot of positives. So they really are going to throw out the baby with the bathwater, I'm afraid. I mean, my view of it is, and I'm, I'm reviewing a book called The Cult of Smart, which is just one in these series of books that is critical of the meritocracy. My view of it is that um, 
we really need a society that recognizes that there are many forms of excellence um, and not just those that are dependent on high IQ. Uh, we've, we have a withering, I think, conception of, of moral excellence, of, of the excellence of virtue, of the importance of respectability, of playing one's social roles in a dutiful and responsible way. We've denigrated all of those virtues as, as the respect due to them has fallen away, all that's really left uh, is this rapacious economic competition where, frankly, smarter people are going to do better. <laughs> they are going to do better in a technocratic society, but that's not all there is to society. So I don't know how to rebuild a kind of polity in which uh, there are multiple sources and centers of respect and respectability. Um, I don't know how to reinvigorate that, uh, but I think that's the way to go. Because if we if we demolish the meritocracy and all the systems that value merit in the sense of ability, ability to perform, to satisfy other people's needs and wants through free markets, um, we are going to impoverish ourselves. We really that's that's the scary part is all this talk about socialism is um, gonna end up hurting everyone. Yeah, I think, you're, I think you're absolutely right. And you mentioned socialism and markets. I have a, an argument about what I think are the root causes of the problems that the US is experiencing now. I'd like to run it by you and see what you, uh, what you think about it. Sure. It's, 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 more, it's more dire than, than um, anything anything most people put out uh, or are willing to put out these days. But I think the socialism and the lack of market competition is something that was built into the constitution itself with, through the concept of egalitarianism. And the errors are primarily um, rooted in Northern Europe and specifically John Locke and his concept of a blank slate, uh, which Steven Pinker, of course, compellingly took down. But that idea of a blank slate was one of the major, major errors and major problems of the Enlightenment. But that is not the biggest problem. The bigger problem was Smith's idea of objective value, right? The, the labor or objective theory of value, that, it, that a thing has value depending on the amount of work I put into it, as opposed to a subjective value I think has value how, depending on how much I'm willing to pay for it. So this idea of objective value got built into the constitution through the concept of one person, one vote. If society has an objective value, then you can divide it up equally into, uh, you know, between all the citizens, every citizen or every, every property person gets one vote. But I think this is a big error. And I think this is the problem. This quasi egalitarian communism is baked into the American project and we're never going to well, get over I mean, it. That certainly is, um, you know, one, one conception of the, uh, where the constitution and the declaration of independence, of course, went wrong. Um, your comments though, mix up, I think a lot of different aspects of equality, quote unquote. I mean, for example, you, talk about um, uh, the labor theory of value. I, I would disagree that the labor theory of value is in any way incorporated or even adumbrated by the constitution. I mean, first of all, as an economical matter, it's nonsense, right? And I don't associate it with Adam Smith, but maybe that's because I don't know Adam Smith well enough. I associate it with Karl Marx. Um, no, Karl, I mean, Marx Karl, and fact, Engels. This is, a, this is a common misconception. Karl Marx actually took it from Adam Smith. Economists okay, today- Well, then Adam yeah. Smith, you know, is usually right, but on this, I think he was went radically wrong. Yeah, the definitely, he went that, wrong. You know, it, totally wrong. Um, that, you know, the value of um, labor is the measure of the value of what labor produces. Uh, 
I mean, that is antithetical to the way that supply and demand and markets work on the most fundamental level, okay? The value of something is the value of what it commands on the market. And let's face it, there's an element of injustice and arbitrariness to that. It's the measure of it is what people prefer and what people want, which doesn't have any moral valence. I mean, if you prefer oboe music to, you know, klezmer music, the klezmer musicians are not going to make a lot of money. The oboists are going to make a ton of money. And, you know, where's the justice there? Well, you know, there is justice on a profound level, but that's the way that markets work. And hopefully it will incentivize people to do what other people want to satisfy their needs and wants. I and mean, if that's a desirable state of affairs, then it's good. So there is no such thing as objective value. Now, the other aspect of objective value that's potentially dangerous and pernicious is this suspiciousness that attaches to finance and the notion of money making money, right? Which is all caught up with anti-Semitism because of course, Jews were the experts at making money out of money. They were the money lenders. They were the financiers in part because they were good at that stuff in part because they were shut out of everything else. So the idea was that um, there was something sinister and illegitimate about charging interest. You know, it's the age old uh, antipathy to usury, uh, which the Christians managed to tame or at least bracket. Of course, the Islamic countries took it too seriously. So that's partly why they're so backward. Okay, well, I mean, okay. So leaving all that aside, you know, is it the case, I, I was just reading about the Jaffe Bradford debate. This is sort of a little obscure little intellectual debate that took place in the 1970s. The basic issue was Jaffe, who was a very influential conservative said, the founding fundamental principle of our country is equality, right? That is at the very heart and soul. He uh, references Locke, he references very selectively uh, some of the founders principles, the principles of the enlightenment. Uh, and, and he puts that as the pillar and the cornerstone. And Bradford said, absolutely not. If you read the constitution and the federalist papers and what the founders said, they completely and totally accepted that people are unequal in fact, unequal in their talents, unequal in their diligence, unequal in their abilities unequal in their virtue, their capacities. They did not take all men are created equal to mean anything but right, legal equality and maybe political equality, although they are not even so sure about that. I mean, they, they didn't really think that everybody was equally equipped to play the same role in government. And certainly the constitution did not adopt one man, one vote, one woman, one vote, or anything like it. They were the inheritors of traditions from uh, Anglo-Protestant culture from Britain, where there was nothing like a universal franchise, nothing at all, okay? So right off the bat, you have two radically different conceptions of what equality means and how limited it is. Now, one of the reasons Bradford in this debate was very wary of um, even notions of equality of opportunity or anything but the most formal type of equality, really legal equality, equality before the law, is that he predicted that it would inevitably result in the demand for equality of result and that the demand for equality of result would decrease people's liberty, de Tocqueville, of course, made the same predictions, would result in the growth of government, of government manipulation of social life and political life and civic life on every level in order to adjust and readjust to bring about that equality. And there would inevitably be a leveling down, okay, of uh, excellence, of human excellence, human personality, eccentricity, variety, et cetera. Now, all of these predictions have come to pass. Uh, so, I'm sorry, so, so, I, so I, I close my case, Professor Wax. 
I close my well, case. Well, why do so. they have to? That's the question. I mean, I puzzle over this. Why, why is it that, you know, equality won't stay put behind the limits and restraints, the cabining to legal equality? Why is it that it inevitably expands to demands for equality? In fact, now Tocqueville and some of the founders, if you read the Federalist Papers, Madison is very clear-eyed about this, they think that the reason, the potential reason, although they don't say it in so many words, is envy and is the temptations for oppression of some groups in a democracy uh, towards others. That the people who are the have-nots, who are the losers, who are the less capable, the less prescient, uh, the less prudent, I think that's a I think that's a powerful argument. No envy, envy. They will they will exploit you know. And he specifically talks about debt cancellation. Does that sound familiar? Right. What are we debating in the United States now? Massive debt cancellation, which favors debtors over creditors. The inroads into property rights, which the founders were obsessed with. You know, they just saw the temptation to appropriate the property of others as the ultimate evil of democracy, okay? The, the ultimate evil temptation of democracy in the name of equalization and justice. You know, so all of this stuff is, is an ever-present temptation. And I think the real question is, and I, ha I don't have a ready answer, you know, what are the bulwarks against this kind of thing? Uh, one of them has to be just on the pure level of values, let's call it ideology, the love of liberty. You know, we are losing, we have lost as a country this Whiggish love of liberty, which is bred in the bone. It is learned, you know, on your mother's knee and transmitted through families, through communities. It's a British legacy. Uh, it is very historic and it is very sort of ethnically uh, inflected. And when you have a very diverse society with people from alien cultures that have no tradition of liberty, you will see its erosion, you know, and that's considered a racist thing to say. I don't think it is. I, I, no, I, I agree. Not. I don't think it is. I don't think it is. But I think we disagree in the sense that, OK, it's British, but we have to deal with the consequences. The consequences are what the US is going through now. They, this is the inevitable outcome of British ideas. No? Well, but that's the question. I mean, is it the inevitable outcome or is it the outcome of um, a kind of perversion of British ideas through a misguided idealism about what is needed to preserve the balance between liberty and equality and the dangers of too much democracy. And I think the, if you go back to the Federalist Papers again, the founders were not hyper-Democrats. They were not plebiscitory Democrats. They did not embrace the principle of one man, one vote. They believed in the Republic, right, which meant layers of institutional checks and safeguards between the people, you know, and power. Uh, now, maybe, you know, what you're saying, and several people have said, that doesn't work. Eventually, it disintegrates. I think that's, um, I think that's, that's precisely my argument. It was, it was fine. It's a, a, a heroic effort. It's worked very well for a couple of centuries, but as soon as America was called to task and was asked to live up to those principles, the principles of the Declaration of Independence, some of the, the principles that are talked about in the Federalist Papers, then it started to crumble. And that's, an, that's I argue, is a sign or an indication that the foundation from the beginning was not all the way sound. And I think okay, the idea- arguments you're making here. I mean, one is the argument that 
there were principles implicit in the Constitution and the Declaration that contained the seeds of their own destruction. So you talk about the blank slate. Okay? Exactly. Now, not I, only that. Not only that. Reject the idea that the Constitution, the founders, the writers of the Constitution, the people who you know were in charge at the beginning and set up our republic. I reject the idea that they believed in a blank slate. You cannot read the Federalist Papers and come away with the conclusion that they thought that human nature was socially constructed, could be made and remade by society, was not inborn, was not God-given. You cannot come away with that idea, okay? So- no, absolutely, I just, absolutely. I can see that. That's, the argument is not that, that Locke had a direct impact on the-, the Not that far, part of it. Yeah, no, no, not that part of it. However, the founders, despite their their awareness of the fact that people were not equal, that they wanted a republic and they wanted systems of checks and balances, they still did not have the foresight to understand that even among property individuals, if you don't have market competition, you're going to get communism is going to take over. You have well, to I think introduce they took market, market competition for granted. I mean, that's the thing, just the way they took, you know, the family for granted. I mean, they didn't anticipate women's emancipation, which was a major upheaval. Uh, they didn't anticipate the uh, dissolution of the family, which I think is, you know, just underestimated as a centrifugal force uh, in society. Uh, they didn't anticipate the secularization, the, the loss of faith, that is also uh, a very weakening force in our society. So, you know, there already you have a failure of foresight on the part of, of the founders. Um, I think, and, and so, you know, leaving aside there, they did not adopt a blank slate point of view, but so what is, has led inexorably to this slide? Well, I will go back to my pragmatic point, which they did anticipate, which is that the losers would um, prey on the winners. Okay, and yeah. they, they worried about that terribly. And they never came up with a definitive, you know, airtight solution to that problem. And I think that, you know, the, the weakening of religious conviction, of institutional integrity, of the family, of um, historical sense, all of that is related to the, uh, this feeling that the have nots have, that all of the prior restraints and checks on them are now being abandoned, right? And they are free to give full, uh, expression to their their envy uh, and their desire to um, have what the haves have and you know not put up with their position. I, I think all those trends are related to each other and it has taken a few hundred years but now we are at the point where you know I really think we're at a crisis point um, in that the bill for equality of result is coming due. Uh, and it's it's very very dangerous, and I don't know what's going to happen. Um, not bad things are going to happen, <laughs> actually. Uh, sorry no, to I'm, say. I'm uh, not sure why. We're, I'm not I'll sure why we're dead. Happening, but I'll be suppose. dead, but I do have three children, uh, and uh, they they will in due time have their own children, and uh, that they're going to have to deal with this. So. No, I, I agree with you. And, and interestingly enough, Charles Murray also has finally given up. He said he didn't want to give up early in his career. He saw some of the dangers, but he didn't want to give up. And more recently, he has uh, flat out, he says, no, the party's over. This is not going to last. The American experiment was fun while it lasted. But, uh, you know, America will still or the U.S. will still be uh, very successful in many ways for many years to come. But the original uh, vision of a country founded on freedom and limited government that that was that was basically over right um, and suspiciousness towards tyranny and you know I, I hate to be the skunk at the party but I really have to say that the sort of hyper diversity that we have invited through you know very 
upheaval in immigration policies has not helped things at all because it just you know heightens divisions it exacerbates difference um, you if you're trying to bring in too many people who don't come from these traditions it's very very hard to socialize and and uh, assimilate them and we're not even trying I mean we really have a ruling class that is, the thrust of their ideology is in the very opposite direction. You know, it's the United States is a horrible place. Um, liberty is uh, not the paramount value. Equality has to be achieved by hook or by crook. Uh, big, not at all suspicious towards big government, but welcoming big government. Um, you know, every to all the trends in the opposite direction to what you would like to see. Uh, and I just don't, you know, I don't know how that can really work. Uh, I think if we had um, had, if we kept our very strict and tight immigration policies that prevailed from 1924 to 1964, uh, it would have made things a lot easier because sameness and homogeneity culturally, nationally, racially, it, it really just you know, gives you the advantage of people having a commonality of interest, commonality of attitude, uh, and the differences are less. That's all. I mean, the differences are just less. Countries like, you know, Scandinavia, well, they, they've loosened their immigration policies too, but they're still overwhelmingly, uh, for now, homogeneous. And, you know, the virtues of homogeneity are underappreciated. That's what nation yeah. states are for. Uh, that's, that's an interesting argument. I think I, I think I agree with you. I, I definitely agree with you. I think it's what's make what makes it all of this even more tragic is the the idea that uh, you have to force people to like you, or you have to force people to um, believe what you believe, or uh, you know accept people that you don't that you have differences with. And that's, uh, that's unfortunate. You know, well, we but should... I think to turn it around that there's something evil uh, and nasty about preferring your own, preferring people like you, wanting to live with people like you. You well, know, you I, can't- I'd like, to, I'd like to close with that because I know you have a, a, another commitment. Bear, yeah. Close with that idea because I think it's a profound one. The idea that um, the- we've gotten to the point where we can't say the most basic truths that I have preferences. Right. You can't have preferences. I think this is an indication of just how, unfortunately, and I hate to bag on the British, but I think they just got it all wrong. They just, this is the inevitable result of British ideas, the British communist ideas that were baked into the, the constitution and the idea that even among propertied people, that they can vote even amongst the um, the checks and balances that people can vote that one person's vote counted as the same as another person's vote even among the property classes. I think this is a fundamental error. It's 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 communism. And it, well, it's a matter of degree. I mean, first of all, if they if if the United States and and other countries in Europe had engaged in aggressive demographic management, which is a euphemism, which means you know. <laughs> to preserve the ethnic character fundamentally of the community, which doesn't mean persecuting other people, okay? And it doesn't mean not having anyone from other groups. It just means keeping them, you know, in a very limited minority and insisting on preserving the core culture, you know, as like in France, La Cité, which they're finally waking up and saying, we, we want to be French, we want our our national life to be, you know, deeply and fundamentally French. I mean, that that kind of thinking is really under attack and it should not be under attack. Right? Everybody's staying in their own lane, staying in their own nation and building their own nation. Or look at the attitude towards Orban in Hungary. Isn't he an awful person? Because he wants to keep Hungary Hungarian, you know? Sure. Uh, it doesn't get rid of all the problems. It just, I think, dials down the the magnitude and the amplitude of the problems. So, you know, that I think we're beginning to realize that 
you know, diversity is not our strength. I, pr I personally think this whole diversity is our strength thing is just total propaganda. It's, it's Orwellian uh, nonsense. Well, and I think what should be what, say that. What, what should be uh, the case is, okay, if you think diversity is a strength, then fine, form your diversity and let's compete. I think this would be, I think if you're going to allow freedom, okay, you feel like diversity is a strength, great. Form Don't your impose diverse. it on everyone. Exactly, right. exactly. And then allow right, your people. Own company, your own little community. Right? Sure. But if, if you want to live in a, a community that's all upper middle class, you know, white or whatever, I mean, people have good reasons for that. Certainly blacks prefer to live with blacks. You know, there are these preferences. They are expressed. In fact, on the ground, people indulge them. It's just you're not allowed to just come out and say it right because it's considered exclusionary very but anyway good. professor uh, professor wax well, i know you have to go well well thank you very much for your time again i wish you the best i will look forward to reading your article and hopefully we can talk again sometime in the future yes yeah, so, well there's so much to talk about we need to talk about the election and all of that and some of the other topics so i hope we'll get to do that in the future well thanks so much professor wax have a great uh, rest of the day and a great week. Thank you. Stick around and let's reason together.